I've been working on a new version, uh, the, what's going to be the next version of Rubinius that uh, lets you do actual concurrency. So this is basically a straight dig at Blake's talk yesterday about Ruby not being very CPU concurrent. We were spending a, lot, a bunch of time on this, and I want to just demo it for you really fast. And I probably should have thought about that. Okay, <laughs> so uh, this, this is two minutes, but the benchmarks take longer to run than that. So we're only going to run sort of some of these on MRI because it's so fucking slow. Okay, so here we go. So this is a script right here. This is what the script looks like just so we for your edification. It's just going to loop here. It's running this script that is called gilwin2. And uh, we'll go look at that script in a second. So right now, it's basically just doing a simple numerical algorithm uh, uh, for a large range of numbers, adding them all up and doing some very simple transform on them. And the idea is, if you take that large range of numbers and you split it up between threads, do you get any? It, it, do you reduce the number, the amount of runtime? So, i.e., are you able to actually? process individual chunks of this range independently. So on MRI right now, you can see that it's basically negligible. This is, the, this is the column we're looking at here, folks. So you can see that by having more threads, we're actually just fucking the system up. We're not, doing, we're not getting anything out of it. It's just a total fail. So we'll just cancel that. Uh, as you can see, I'm doing one, up to four threads. So there we did three threads, and it didn't get us anything, so we're just going to forget that. So the current version of Rubinius, which is 101, um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll just let it scroll off the top. Okay, so uh, we're going to run it again right now. And this is the 1.101 version of Rubinius um, doing the exact same workload. And this, this bar over here is the CPU meter, and I've also got this number right here. Uh, and seconds. you can see... The, we're, for the most part, only getting one CPU bar up at a time. And if you glance over here, you'll see that we're only getting maybe up to 100% if we're lucky. Otherwise, it's like 99, hovering around there. Um, is that really it? That is the end. That's, that's okay. the end, my friend. So while the other person comes up here, you can see. You <laughs> like. <laughs> All right. You should, uh, you should give them a 30 second warning. So okay. I could have just jumped to the end. Sorry, I gave, I gave oh, 10 sure because you were tight, but yes. Can I have your that's, oh, that's a step. Yes. Okay. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. All right, I, I got a brief moment. I just want to say, everybody having a great time today? No, no, come on. Can I hear you? Everyone having a good time? I want everybody say a very special thank you to Josh, to Jim, to Leanne, to all the other organizers. Thank you all very much for doing this. Come on, everyone, give them a hand. Go Ron. All right, let's see what happens. Hello. All right. So I'm here to talk about Ticketmaster, which is about taking control of your ticket and project management systems, which, you know, they're kind of unruly. First of all, my name is Ron Evans, aka Dead Program. I'm with the Hybrid Group, or a consultancy based out of Los Angeles. But here I'm here to talk about you guys. Now, you're all different, and our clients are all different, and they have a lot of different needs, but there's one thing that they all do, which is they somehow manage and control the projects that they're working on. Often, they maybe are using your typical Agile board, right? Pieces of paper, notepads, whatever. Some of them are using software, like uh, this well-known piece of software. Others, this, Lighthouse. But the problem if you're a consultancy that has a lot of different clients is it turns out that a whole bunch of them are using every different system and ones you've never even heard of. What do you do about it? You're trapped. You have to use whatever they are using because they're the client and you're the consultant and they're paying the bill. So what do you do about this? Well, we created something called Ticketmaster, which is basically a universal API to ticket tracking and project management systems, kind of ties into the workflow thing we were talking about. Here's a very brief overlay of it. Similar to your database connectivity, you've got some providers that talk to the different backend ticketing and project management systems. You can talk to that through your application, through our API, through the command line interface. All right, cool, let's look at some code really fast. All right, so here's a very, very basic, simple one that it is designed to open up the Lighthouse provider and then iterate through all of the projects that are associated with your account and just dump them out the ID and the name. So pretty, pretty simple stuff. Let's look at something a little more different. What happens when you have multiple Lighthouse clients? 
Uh, you can set up a particular API key in a configuration file that's either per project or on your machine. We, I tend to do it per project because that way I switch to a client project. Everything's already set up for whatever project management or ticketing system they happen to be using. So here's another simple example. This one is using Pivotal. And it's just opening up the last project in the list of projects and then iterating through all of the tickets saying the ID and the title. All right, well, that's cool. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, so now let's talk about something more interesting, which is I would like to take all of my Pivotal tickets and move them to Lighthouse. All right, so we're going to open the Ticketmaster Pivotal and Lighthouse providers, open the Pivotal project, a particular one, open the Lighthouse provider, create a new Lighthouse project, and then for each of the Pivotal tickets, go through and create a new Lighthouse ticket, and then copy the comments in. All right, that's very cool. We want to do that, migrating from one system to another. In fact, that's such a typical use case that we have made it with a copy, deep copy, which will copy automatically all of the information from one project to another because this kind of migration or synchronization is a very typical scenario. All right, so what can you do with all this? Well, we currently support Pivotal Tracker, Lighthouse, Basecamp, GitHub Issues, Unfuddle, uh, people are working on Jira, other back-end systems. It's very simple, you only need to derive from four different classes, the provider, the project, ticket, and comments, and voila, you are speaking to your back-end system, whatever it happens to be. And so we want you, that's right, you guys, because we need help, it's an open source project. Try it out, see what happens. What's the worst that can happen, right? Help us fix it. Or just tell everyone about it. Come on, start tweeting. The revolution will be Twittered, and it's all about Ticketmaster. Thank you guys very much. For more info, go check out TicketRB.com, and thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ron. You're, you're a minute under. Nice. Next up, we've got Pete Ford and the Impossible Project. Am I on? Yes, I am. Hello, I'm Pete, and I'm from Toronto, I'm from Canada, and I'm from Unspace. Who's from Canada? Um, okay, so this is not a talk about Ruby. Who here, put up your hands if you know what this is. Okay, so for the rest of you, I'm going to sex you out. Mm -hmm. Oh. Hold on while I focus on Infinity. Let's go. There. It's Megatron. No, Megatron's over there. All right, so how was I just able to do that? Because you might have heard that the Polaroid factories all got shut down. Of course, there was a lot of dirty politics involved that most people probably didn't hear about. Um, what actually is interesting is that at the, the closing of the, 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 the factory in uh, the Netherlands, uh, this guy, Florian Capps, who's a personal hero of mine, who similarly to I, has been bit by the analog photography bug. He went and got drunk with these guys who were running the factory. They were careerist factory workers who put out Polaroid film. And they all got told to dismantle all their equipment. And uh, this guy basically was able to like, get them drunk and thinking wildly about what would happen if they were able to you know, maybe get a lease on the factory, reinvent some new film, hire all the dudes, and relaunch it as a niche product. Um, this, of course, speaks to me because if you were around me in Toronto during 2008, this is actually what I was pitching investors on at the time. So I'm a music fan, and I always say that there's two types of bands that I love. There's bands that I wish I was in, and there's bands that I'm glad they're doing it so that I don't have to. And moving to the Netherlands and moving into a factory and restarting Polaroid production was something I was kind of willing to do, but I'm really glad someone else did it for me. So basically, this is a fascinating open source project. It's not software, it's film. These guys literally could not continue to make Polaroid film. It wasn't just a financial decision. That was a big factor in it, but they ran out of the raw materials required to make the stuff. So basically, they had to actually sit down and create from scratch an entirely new chemical process. Uh, they gave themselves a year. They almost hit the mark. I think they ended up launching in June of the, uh, sorry, March of this year. 
And the picture that I took just now is from the very first box of the very first batch of their first color film. It's developing in my pocket. Unfortunately, it's still very beta. It's light sensitive. So I say that it's an open source project because they are handling it like an open source project. They are appealing to the hearts and minds of people who will pay expensive amounts for the film and test it because it's still very, very unstable. So that means that if I don't keep this dry, if I don't put desiccant in a box and dry it out for about two weeks after I take the picture, in a month I won't actually be able to see you fine folks that I took a picture of. Um, but the thing is, is that they're sort of embracing their faults and actively soliciting feedback and they're saying, listen, we, are, we have flaws, we're still working this out, but with your help we can all sort of reinvent this new analog film dynasty together. And I'm really sort of um, proud to be sort of a part of this and I'm encouraging you all, you can get these cameras for under 100 bucks on eBay, it's gorgeous. I mean, look at the design of this thing. This is like an Apple design, but like before Apple. And it, it's just so elegant that you can even get all this much awesome in one small, convenient little pouch. And if this isn't sexy to you, I mean, hey, that's cool. But if you've been <laughs> noticing over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of like SLRs showing up at conferences. I'm not entirely sure what all of you all are taking pictures of, but maybe next time bring one of these because you might actually have a lot of fun learning how to use light and um, you know catching the totally bizarre random moments and the weird chemical deficiencies of the film that they're pushing on us. It's all a lot of fun and honestly if you end up hating this process, just come back to me and I'll take whatever film you have left and refund you the money out of my pocket. Have a good day everybody. I just wanted to say thanks to Leia because honestly, Leia rocks. She's back there. I kind of, is it inappropriate to ask for a, like a standing O? For that no. Because she, she has done a lot to make sure that this is smooth. And well deserved. Next up, David Stevenson on Fixture Builder. Hey guys, uh, can you hear me? Great. Okay, I talked last year about Sandbox and Ruby, and today I'm here to talk about something actually more useful. Um, I work at Pivotal Labs, and we do a huge number of projects, and about two or three years ago, everybody in the Rails world was using fixtures, and I think everyone here is probably familiar with why that was a terrible idea. The biggest problem that we encountered was they're totally unmaintainable, and they're 100% wrong almost immediately. The amount of work you have to spend to keep your fixtures up to date is just, I mean, it's just impossible to, um, to maintain in a, in a system that has thousands of tests. But the real good thing about fixtures is that they were fast and they were really repeatable because the data was codified in these files and it didn't change unless you changed it. So then came factories and uh, that, we have Factory Girl, we have uh, Fixture, I'm sure there are others that I don't know about. And I thought factories were really amazing until I had about a thousand tests using factories. Yeah. And then I, my test suite is like a, an hour long and I'm having to figure out how to parallelize it and I'm having to do things to make it go faster. And so I learned that you can make it go faster. All you have to do is maybe not save your file and not save your records as much as possible. Keep the number of objects down to a bare minimum. But that sort of kept, went against the principle that I could just throw together some factories and write tests. That, um, but, but it did give me all these advantages, right? It was really easy and, and it was maintainable and it was flexible and it was always accurate because it used the models that I defined in active record to come up with the data. So it solved all the problems of fixtures but, but brought its own problems in that it was too slow. So just to remind everybody, okay, here's, here's an example of a test written using, using factory. We're factoring up a product and doing some validation against it. It's kind of a naive test because we're creating like 10 objects in this before block here. This is just an example of how you could use factories, maybe poorly, to generate large amounts of data. This is guaranteed to get slow over time. If I were to write the same thing with fixtures, I would say at the top I'd replace at product with a particular product from my fixture file, and, and this would go much faster. I wouldn't actually be saving any objects throughout my test. So good news, but I would have to maintain these things myself. So enter fixture builder. We're gonna use factories to generate fixtures. We're gonna define a block of code that block of code is going to generate large numbers of objects, any number of objects we want, 
And then at the end of the day, that's going to be serialized. So the block of code looks something like this. Um, in the middle part of the screen here, you can see we're defining uh, a product, maybe two products, some variations of those products. As soon as that end is hit, the state of the database is serialized, or actually we, we run our test first. And you can see it, it says building fixtures and build products.yaml and variants.yaml. At the end of the day, out come the fixtures. And Fixture Builder does some cool stuff like figuring out how to name your fixtures based on fields that it recognizes. But getting back to this, um, it also modifies, it looks at a particular sets of files for changes and decides when to be smart about rebuilding its fixtures. So we've brought this into several of our uh, customers at Pivotal. And we found that it's really easy if you start from the beginning but adding this to an existing project is very expensive. You have to go through and normalize all of your tests. So the reason I'm preaching it to you today is if you add it at the beginning of your project, you'll be much happier than if you have thousands of tests that are using factories and running extremely slowly and you didn't think of this. Um, see if I have anything else. No, thanks, here's the GitHub URL. While David's changing over, next up we've got Noah Gibbs, who is getting rid of Java. And who can't get behind that, really? Uh, that's me. Okay. So uh, he's good enough to uh, let me use his laptop since my Ubuntu one is not working. Uh, I work at onsite.com. Uh, we had about an eight-year-old legacy Java and JSP code base running on Tomcat, and we've switched over to JRuby for pretty much all of the new stuff. For anybody who might want to do something similar, or if you've got any friends that really need to kick their Java habit, this is a little of how we've done that. So JRuby, for those who aren't familiar, is really, really good for calling methods on Java objects from Ruby. And uh, just a, a very quick summary there. Is that code at all visible to anybody? No. no. Highlight it. Not the size. No. Yeah, no, it's the color. The colors. No, no that's not. That's not. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So I have like four minutes. Um, you can import things directly. You can create new Java objects. You can call methods. The way the method name conversions there works is visible. Um, All right, so uh, chances are very good. Your Java uh, code base is already written as if it were you know, with models. You've got objects that read from the database that do your validations that look an awful lot like active record models in terms of purpose. Uh, it would be really nice if you could switch to active record, but in general, uh, that's going to be a harder sell because you're going to have to rewrite a lot of validation logic. However, if you've got JRuby, then and it's still not at all visible. What you can do is you can write an active record wrapper that uses that uses your existing tables, your existing sequences, not your existing logic, but you can write wrapper functions around that that will call your Java, uh, that will do a, that will wrap it in Ruby objects, and as a result, you can write your new views. Um, so, in addition to your to our existing JSPs, we've added a whole bunch of new views, and all of them. What we do is we write them as regular Rails uh, views except that our finders are basically Java. Uh, you wrap it in an active record instance like this, and all of the validation logic is done in Java. You're writing through to the Java objects, you're using finders from the Java objects. Uh, we do it in a couple of different ways. Uh, the advantage doesn't actually end there. Um, because once you've done that, you can take active record objects, either these wrappers or other ones for your tables. You can declare a Java interface, use them there, and you can essentially swap out the entire uh, former Java object. You can call through to Ruby from Java. Uh, I'm sorry, can, can you speak up? Oh, hey, good view. Oh, uh, view. Oh, view. Um, 
Sorry, view and do what? Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. So as a result, um, you can basically swap out your large Java app piecemeal. You can start with the views. You can move on to writing supplemental models that exist alongside the Java models or you know, for new stuff that exists in addition to the Java models, including using them where necessary from Java. Um, and that lets you go through and you can do the rewrite eventually. Uh, you may not have to do it all. You may want to do it all. Uh, but for those of you who haven't looked into JRuby, this is very much the, uh, the expected use case. It works really well. We've had really good luck with it. I'd be happy to talk about the details to anybody. Um, in general, Rails is easier to write views in. You get much better caching when you start switching to it from active sense. record. Um, and you'll have a much easier time selling it to the business people uh, if you can do it piecemeal like this. So look into it. It's worth doing if you're trying to get rid of Java. Um, let's see. How long do I have left? 13 seconds. Awesome. Well then, um, you can also use Ruby for testing, even if you're testing the Java stuff. Again, look into JRuby, it's awesome. Excellent. Thanks so very much, Noah. Next up, Amon Gupta, talking about perftools.rb. Hey guys, uh, my name is Amon. I go by TMM1 on Twitter. Uh, I did a talk called Debugging Ruby at Lone Star a couple, a couple weeks ago. I'm just going to do a five minute version of that talk. Uh, the talk is basically about debugging tools and tools you can use uh, to figure out what's going on in your production systems. And I'm going to focus on my favorite tool in the talk, which is Perf Tools. Uh, Perf Tools is a CPU profiler that Google wrote and uses. Uh, so there's a bunch of information on here about how to get up and running. Uh, but the cool thing is basically uh, it gives you a profile both in text format and in a nice visualization like you see on the right. And the cool thing about this is you can just take a look and the boxes that are the biggest are the functions that are taking uh, the most amount of time or the most amount of CPU cycles. Uh, so it shows you what to focus on, what to try to improve. So I run this on my Ruby processes. This is a C-level profiler, so it gives you information about what C functions are being called a lot. Uh, which can still be pretty useful. So this is something I ran in production on one of my Rails applications, and it showed that uh, the function rb store sub bang inside the VM was uh, basically sp it was spending about 10% of its time in that function, and I was able to trace that back to uh, the time.parse function, and figured out that all of these MySQL date times were being parsed in Ruby land and eating up a lot of CPU. So this was really useful, and what I wanted was instead of seeing C-level functions in this output to get Ruby-level functions instead. So I created a project called perftools.rb, which is the Ruby equivalent of perftools. Uh, again, some information on how to use this, but say you have this simple Sinatra application that has two routes. One, uh, which is compute heavy, so it computes uh, the Fibonacci sequence for the first 10,000 numbers, and one that's sleep heavy, so it spends a lot of time, but not necessarily on the CPU. It just calls sleep. So you could profile this and you'd end up with graphs like this. So uh, you can actually run Perfectals RB in two different modes, CPU mode or real time mode. So on the right you can see CPU mode and of course the compute action shows up at the top because it's using a lot of CPU cycles. But if you run it in real time mode, uh, you see on the left sleep shows up at the top because even though it's, it takes longer, even though it's not using as much CPU. So I've used this on a bunch of open source projects, the Reddit start RB, the first couple of versions used system timer in every single read and write that it showed right away. There was a lot of overhead associated with that. Uh, you can run this on Ruby gems and see where it's spending a lot of its time. It happens to be uh, in file system access, trying to figure out what di directories and files exist. Uh, I ran this on Bundler recently and found out that a lot of time was being spent in gem version spaceship, uh, about 23% of the time. And so with a little, little, little bit of optimization, micro-optimization to that function, we were able to increase the overall performance of bundle install. Um, that patch is going to be in the next version of Ruby Gems. I also recently added an object allocation mode. And so uh, you can just set this variable and basically instead of CPU cycles, each box represents the number of objects that were allocated inside that function. And so again, this is on a production app. And you can see that the uh, date parse function was creating tons and tons of objects, about 15 to 16% uh, of all the objects created were being created in that function. Uh, and so recently uh, we're switching over to MySQL 2 since that moves all of the date parsing down to C and gets rid of a bunch of objects as well as CPU overhead. 
So I encourage all you guys to use this, and the easiest way to do this is with a project called Rack Perf Tools Profiler. And all you have to do is, in your Rails application, you can pull in this piece of middleware, and it just adds a bunch of URLs that you can just start visiting to start profiling your application. The easiest one is, all you do is on any URL add profile equals true and times equals some number, and it'll run that action that many times, produce a profile, and in your browser spit out that GIF right away. So uh, that's my talk. Uh, there's a lot of other tools that I cover, tools for Linux like strace and Ltrace, tools for C like GDB, tools for networks like TCP dump and ngrep, uh, CPU usage stuff, memory usage stuff, and all these slides are available on uh, Scribd. You can go to bit.ly slash debugging Ruby. Awesome. Next up, John Woody Woodell. He's going to talk about dubious. Hey, as you can see that. Okay, guys, uh, so I'm going to tell you a little about dubious. Dubious is something that lets you basically mix in servlets into your uh, Rails app without uh, having to get grossed out by writing a bunch of Java code. There's a project here called Mira Dubious, and I tell you, go bring down a bunch of uh, stuff and run it right out of there. There's no gems or even versions. Um, and if you run it, uh, you know, there's a little drawer here that opens up. It's actually using jQuery, not prototype. Hopefully that's uh, okay. And it just tells you the versions that you're actually running there. Uh, and so I have a little trip app here that I created and I you know, want to create a little app here. I can pick a date. I'm going to say go Ruko. I'm going to say it's that date. That's the wrong date. OK, so, um, so I have that little app running locally. And because it's running an app engine, I can run this little AH thing. And I can poke around my data. It has a built-in data viewer. If I want to modify the app, for example, I'm going to control C out of here. We do have an, a continuous integration thing running, but it's a little bit tweaky. So instead, I'm going to go over to this guy here. Mm, I'm going to go to here. All right, so I'm going to jump in here and grab uh, a change I want to make. I'm going to go into my model. I want to put timestamps on it. So I have some timestamps here. Uh, that's basically what I would need to do for my timestamps. App models. So there's my model. You see, I'm importing some Java classes. We're cloning. Can you see that? All right. How's that, guys? All right. So I'm uh, I'm cloning kind of like the data mapper style and importing any any class that I mentioned. And then anywhere down here, I can import that uh, paste that piece of code that I copied. So you notice here, I'm also creating something where I take a URL from basically from uh, Google Docs and convert it. I also have this little uh, hash that I wanted to uh, put in there. And if I want to look at uh, that, I can go into my apps, views, trips, show. Um, so my ERB template looks kind of like that. Now technically it's not ERB because it's Mira, but it looks a lot like ERB. That's kind of a gross looking template, but that's, that's what you saw. Now, I've just made a couple changes. Well, I've made a change to my model. I'm going to actually, I'm actually going to compile it. So what's happening there? Well, it looks at that uh, model that I had, and it takes those properties and expands it out to a bunch of Java method calls that I need in order for it to uh, talk to Java. In fact, it looks kind of like that. It just generates a bunch of gross Java. Now, technically, I don't have to look at that. That's I can generate that if I want to see what's actually going on. Oh, and now it's done. So if I go back to my script server, I can see that it's running. And if I go back over here, now you, you might notice there's no timestamps on here. I've got some attributes, but no timestamps. If I go back in to this and I, am I running locally? Yeah, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to just, say, oops, I need to edit it. I'm going to save it. And then I should see in this other window here that now, oops, now I have uh, entity types. I should have this new timestamp created at that got created. So I just recompiled it. Now, I, how much time do I have? One minute 15. One, that's enough time to publish it. Why don't I just go publish it? What the heck? So I'll go to this browser here. I'm going to say go Garuko demo. And I'm going <laughs> to copy that. I'm going to create an app. 
And then I'm going to find my terminal again, which is somewhere there. I'm going to cut out of there. I'm going to, I'm going to have to edit my app config. Oops. I'm going to tell it that, in fact, I want to be something called Go God. Did I type that correctly, Three guys? Seconds. Go. 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 Did I type that the same way? Yes. You're missing the code. What the code is? Hurry. <laughs> 15 <laughs> seconds. Attention. And. Oops. Oh, four, three, two, one. Awesome. You can go awesome. check it out. It's published in a second. Great job, Woody. Thanks so very much. Next up is Seth Lab with Smart Browsers. Okay, how's it? My name is Seth Ladd. Uh, I work at Google and I love Ruby, so I'm glad to be here. We're going to start this with a little audience participation. So the question I have for all of you is, if you had to pick, you know, a client approaches you today and you had to pick a mobile platform to develop for, what platform would that be? Just yell it out. iPhone. iPhone. A little bit Android. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, so. And why did, why did that come right off the top of your head? Just yell it out. Like, why, why'd you pick that? Market share. Money? What? Market share. Market share. What? It's good. It's good. Okay. So, yeah. Great, you know, rich SDK. Yeah. Market share. There's an app store. People have them. Uh, just a really great user experience, right? Okay. That, make, that makes perfect sense. Here is uh, from quarter one, 2010. Look at the market share. 28% for iPhone. So, you just said that I don't want to help. 72% of potential users out there. And yet, you were totally okay with immediately saying iPhone. And thank you, Andrew. So uh, I, I would like to say that I, I'm not exactly here to say that that's wrong. I think that there's a lot of good reasons why we made that choice, but you have to understand what you just said, all right? So I would like to say that that exact reasoning and logic should apply to how you approach web development. And I think you should think about browsers as smart browsers, just like you think about some phones as smartphones. Okay? And for the reasons that you target smartphones should be the same reasons you should target smart browsers. All right? Now, and I think it's perfectly valid, and I want us to kind of flip the way we approach this. Why is this possible today? Of course, HTML5. Tremendous amount of rich APIs that are available to you for these smart browsers that give your users a very great, rich user experience, the type of user experience that you can monetize. So some of the functionalities out there, audio, video, obviously, WebGL for 3D, speech-to-text, text-to-speech, file APIs, web workers, desktop notifications, Canvas SVG, fonts, geolocation, device orientation. I mean, all of this stuff is now becoming available on the rich web and in smart browsers. You should target smart browsers. This is your delivery platform. Okay, let's look at some demos real quick. First here, device orientation. Whoa. Yes, available today, and I just messed that up. Sorry about that. Cool. Okay, th this is just JavaScript listening to the device orientation APIs present you know, in, in MacBook. This is on WebKit. Okay. So this is CSS with 3D transformations. There is just a smidge of JavaScript here in this demo. This is all CSS. This runs on your iPad. No other like complex JavaScript program or anything. This is just showing you what is possible with just using the facilities of HTML5 and our smart browsers. Your users are going to love this. Okay, moving on. Okay, so the point here is target smart browsers first. Gracefully degrade, okay? So for example, you don't have to like kill yourself trying to get rounded corners on IE6. Just not worth it. They can see square corners. Everything's going to be fine. Just use border radius. Move on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here's a great quote that I love. What would you have me do? Spend my time hacking around issues and older technologies like IE6. Would you like me to spend my time 
making the site look the best that it can on better desktop browsers, as well as iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad, Blackberry, and a host of other mobile devices. This is the message we need to take to our clients. They will understand it, especially if you sell them on these are smart browsers. Okay, so what about IE6? Chrome Frame is a plugin that you can install into IE 6, 7, and 8 that is your escape hatch. This is your, this is your ticket out of the problem. It essentially embeds Chrome rendering engine into IE. You just send a header or a meta tag. Seconds. Great, turns it on. Prompt your users to install this. They know plugins, they understand a plugin. This is a plugin that solves your problem. Okay, one more great demo. This is indeed a Ruby conference. 15. <laughs> this is Ruby running in the browser using native client. This is possible today. You don't have to use only JavaScript, although we love JavaScript. Check it out. Okay, native client, go get it. Ruby. All right. Thanks so very much, Seth. Awesome. Next up is Pat Nakajima. Hello. <laughs> Pat Nakajima is the name. How many of you guys use Cucumber? Okay, how many of you guys love it and hate it? Okay, cool. Um, so I say screw Cucumber. Nah, just playing, but not really. Um, my Twitter is Nakajima. My GitHub is Nakajima. I work for a company called GroupMe. We do group text messaging, which means that like, Cucumber kind of breaks down a lot of times. Um, problem with Cucumber are step definitions. You basically have these, the kind of default web wrappy ones that work pretty well, right? Um, they don't really bother you. But if you know about life, you know things fall apart, and especially when you're working with text messages or just all sorts of things that are not like, you know, in the browser, uh, you get kind of things like this. Let me resize that. Uh, can you see that? Given a group with the number 484 blank, uh, when the group adds Pat and the group adds Damon with those phone numbers, uh-oh, uh the problem there is basically group is an instance variable. And when you use instance variables in your step definitions, you're gonna feel pain. Um, so you can do something like this. Uh, given a group with the number 484123, then you can parameterize your steps and say, you know, put the, the group's number in there every single time, but that's getting so long that you can't even see the rest of that line. So parameterizing steps equals pain. So no instance variables and no parameterizing. You're tearing me apart, Cucumber. The solution, as we found it at GroupMe, is to inline your step definition, which basically means ripping out Cucumber. It looks like this. Uh, given a group with that phone number, under that, we do that in comments. We do all the features in comments, and then under each comment, we just write a little bit of capybara to, or just, you know, code to, you know, express that in code. Um, and really, that should be readable enough anyway. If you're writing your code properly, it should just look like group.addpat, group.addDaemon, things like this. Um, what about web steps? You can use stake. Uh, you don't even have to use stake. It's, uh, you can find it there on GitHub but uh, steak is basically just capybara, okay? Um, so then like, people are like, oh, Cucumber's still pretty awesome because of my business guys. They can read it, they can, they can write it. And <laughs> what I say is, uh, you know, they can still write the feature files. You just turn that into comments, then you write the code, it's your job and you're good at it. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Okay. Two minutes flat. Oh, and questions? Excellent. Comments? Arguments? Awesome. What up? All right, all right. I'll talk to you later. Also, right. if you don't get a chance to hear about Blake's thing, it's way cool. Round up. Ask him about it. All right. Okay, coming up next, Nathan Eskenazi and Thomas Schaefer talking about Terminator. My name is Nathan Eskenazi, and this is Thomas. And three days ago, we created a gem that we, we thought solved a very simple problem. Earlier today, you heard a lot of excellent Ruby developers talking about their workflows. And, and so everyone has a different one, but everyone has a workflow. And so what this is about is automating your workflow, making it a lot easier to start it up. So the issue is a lot of times you get set up, you're ready to go, and all of a sudden you hit this. Safari has to update, and bam, you have to restart your computer. Everybody loves this situation. Uh, so after you're all set up, you need to save this and somehow be able to get back to it quickly. So the three points about being a computer programmer are these three, and we're here to tackle these two. That's right. Impatient and laziness, both very important virtues as a programmer. And Terminator hopes to help you solve um, those very quickly when it comes to booting up your workflow. All right. So this uh, will essentially invoke 
uh, terminal commands uh, open for you, saving time and allowing you to get back to work as quickly as possible. Uh, sets up the development environment for every single one of your projects on a per project basis. That's right, so it's actually really easy to set up. Um, it's about as straightforward as you can get. You install Terminator, you type Terminator, create, and you name, it, you name your workflow, and then you can essentially define commands to act on the current directory or on any arbitrary directory. Essentially, this is the exact same thing as just um, doing it manually, except you just define it in a file. This is YML, but we have a uh, full Ruby version coming later um, using block syntax. Yep, so then you just terminate or start my app, and all of a sudden, bam, here you are. You have all your terminals set up. You're ready to go again. Um, yeah, and I want to note right there, it only shows tabs, but we're actually in the middle of also releasing a feature for Windows, as well as arbitrary tab names that you can actually set right in the script file. Um, so there's actually very few commands here. It's extremely straightforward. You can create workflows, you can start a workflow, you can delete your workflows, and you can get a list of all your workflows. Um, I also really wanted briefly to mention that I actually created this while I was working on, um, I'm the creator of a framework called Padrino, and it's actually a Sinatra-based framework that gives you full stack support for a bunch of different ORMs and essentially creating whatever um, websites you want in a sort of an alternative way to um, Rails. So, I actually built this while I was working on Padrino because I was forced to restart and I was like, this is the last time I'm gonna have to set up my terminal, like, like my, my set of tabs. So I was like, all right, I'm just gonna script this up and now I just type Terminator and it sets up automatically. And it's easy to use and enjoy. Excellent. Thanks Nathan and Thomas. Next up is Jim Pulse with What is CoffeeScript? Quick show of hands, how many of you know what CoffeeScript is already? Okay. Um, okay, what is CoffeeScript? Um, answer, nothing I wrote or even contributed to, but it's something that's cool that's out there that I found that I think you guys will love. So, um, so far this weekend, here's what we've heard. We've heard this guy say, I find it kind of a pain to write JavaScript, I'd rather write Ruby. Heard this guy say, most of us have two hammers in our toolbox, Ruby and JavaScript. We've had this guy say, I write almost as much code in Shell as I do in Ruby and JavaScript. There's a theme here. All of us aren't just Ruby programmers, we're Ruby and JavaScript programmers. And then you've heard this guy say, Rails 3.1 will serve your CoffeeScript as view templates. And some of you were probably like, wait, what is that? So CoffeeScript is kind of like SCSS for CSS or Haml for your HTML. It's a wrapper language. It's a little language that compiles into JavaScript. It wraps JavaScript in a nice, Python-ish, Ruby-ish syntax. It's kind of really cool. So let's take a look. This is shamelessly lifted from CoffeeScript.org verbatim. I did not write this even myself. So to assign things, it looks just like JavaScript. You can do string interpolation in double-quoted strings just like you can in Ruby. You can do interpolation in regexes too because, you know, we love doing interpolation in regexes. Awesome. Uh, you can put if statements at the end of the line just like in Ruby. That's kind of cool. Functions just have parens around the arguments and then a little arrow and then the <coughs> body the function. Notice, no return statement. It just returns the last value, just like in Ruby. Arrays look just like in JavaScript. Objects look just like in JavaScript. But notice, commas at the end of lines are optional. Notice, parens around function invocations are optional. You can do splats with arguments. You can get all of your arguments slurped up into an array. You can do array comprehensions like in Python. Uh, there's an existence operator that tells you if a variable exists, and just to be clear about this, this turns into the JavaScript that all of you hate to write because you write it so often. If type of Elvis is not equal, equal undefined, and and Elvis not equal, equal null, then do that. So it's pretty cool. Um, Q Flame War. How many of you like to simulate class-based inheritance in JavaScript? Awesome. Uh, so it's got built-in simulation of class-based inheritance in JavaScript. Uh, notice. Uh, there's an at name. This is like an instance variable that compiles into this dot name. Notice also this constructor function uh, is, has an empty body because constructor functions automatically apply all of their arguments that have at in front of them to the appropriate instance variables with this. It's kind of cool. Destructured assignment. You can actually assign the return value from any, arc, any uh, expression to a complex data structure, just like in Ruby. Notice, object literals, the curly braces are optional. How many of you hate writing dot bind this at the end of all of your inline function declarations? 
So if you notice, if you do this with a equals greater than instead of a dash greater than, it does it for you. That's pretty cool. And that's all. You can learn more at coffeescript.org. Again, this is nothing I did, but it's still really cool. And yes, there's all the tools you need to integrate it into your bigger languages. That's all. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jim. Next up, we've got Shane Becker. It's his birthday. Doing better presentation slides. I'm Shane Becker. I go by Vegan Straight Edge. That's my user picture. You've maybe seen me around. I make websites for fun and profit. This is uh, the man that I work for. I made the Rubinius site. I used to live in Seattle, and I was part of this thing. I made that. Uh, Evan and I recently started Seattle RB South. Um, your <laughs> slides are bad. Bad slides crash shuttles, space shuttles. I'm serious. Um, these are 10 things that will make your slides better. Um, I'll be pointing some fingers because I've had a little bit of evidence the past day and a half. Use big text, really big text. As big as you can get away with. And what helps you get to big text, continuing Avi's idea this morning, is no text. Well, maybe not no text, of course, but less text. Seriously, don't do bulleted lists. Your readers get ahead, your audience gets ahead of you. They're focusing on what I'm not saying. High contrast. Evan used uh, black on blue and it looked like this. It was hard to read. Assume that that thing that's far away with the lights on is half as bright as this thing. Use, use contrasty colors. Um, Ruby doesn't scale, we all know that, so by transitive properties, slides about Ruby don't scale. <laughs> so don't run your text all the way to the edge. The two talks ago, the, really, the two minute one was awesome, real centered slides, but his text went all the way to the edge and got cut off on the left, otherwise it was totally rad. Um, if, you're, if the movement of your content doesn't mean anything, Ryan Davis, don't move your content. It's hard for me to follow. <laughs> But all these slides have been black text on white background. That gets boring in the audience. So mix that shit up a little bit. Maybe while you're talking about mailers, they're all in red. And then when you move to test, they're all about red. Whatever, you could group them together. Also, that was some alliteration. Humans are good at small tables, not at big tables, Blake. Use charts. Let's see if I can do this here. See this? Yeah. Right there? We could see a, a pattern. Humans are good at visualizing patterns that we could see, not in tables, Blake. <laughs> I like Helvetica. I like it tightly kerned. I like it bold. I like it big. I like it spaced out. Yehuda likes Museo. I love Museo. It's really great. Brian used Comic Serif yesterday. That's also a great typeface. Don't use these, please. <laughs> Definitely don't use that. <laughs> This conference has a big stage and a big screen. That's the exception. Usually we have no stage and a little screen, and when you're sitting behind Evan or over in the corner here and looking through the podium, you can't see text on the bottom. So don't put text on the bottom, Rich Kilmer. <laughs> and when you're presenting, don't look up here at your slides, especially if you're wearing a lapel mic, because when you turn your head, it turns it away from the mic and I can't hear you. Look at the audience, not at the screen. And finally, long live the snowman. That was beautiful. Thanks, Shane. I'm not the only design guy in here, so if you're not a design guy, find one of us and we'll help you with your slides. Maybe we can trade some work. Next up is uh, Mislav Mahoney, which I've just minced horribly, and I'm going to ask him to say it the right way. And he's going to talk about Ruby that teaches Ruby. Okay, so um, suppose you know who's uh, why the luck is stiff. Uh, last year, on uh, the night he disappeared, I uh, decided to salvage the, the guide from their internet ar archives, and other people have salvaged his other work, and we all republished it on GitHub the same in the 24 hours of his disappearance. So people decided to commemorate um, the day of why they 
this year, um, and I promised to do something. Uh, and I did, I just didn't publish it. It was um, a little bit broken, it was alpha. It's still alpha, but some people have convinced me to, to, to show it to you right now. So my day, I was doing this. And it's too big. Okay. Um, I wanted to teach Ruby to people I couldn't reach. Uh, this is not for you intermediate or experienced hackers. This is for people who are trying to understand code that they're reading. And uh, I tried to make a parser for code. Actually, I didn't write the parser, but I used some existing projects to parse code and try to explain it to people. So this is a Ruby app written in Sinatra that tries to explain some code. Here I have some code. It's uh, something that everybody of you understand what's going on, except the line wrapping here, ignore that. Um, most of newcomers have need a long time to grok this, right? So what did I do? First, we hit explain down here. Now, this is my local instance, so it's gonna take us to something a bit more ugly. Um, I'm using um, Ruby parser to generate um, a tree of um, you know this program, um, so I can better analyze its syntax. I don't use regular expressions; they're pain. Um, and there is a project called Ruby to Ruby that deconstructs, uh, that uses this uh, tree to reconstruct the Ruby code back. When I first heard of Ruby to Ruby project. I thought, you know, like, why would anybody parse Ruby to generate Ruby from that? And now I'm here using it and thinking it's very cool. Uh, while I'm reconstructing this project, this program, I'm searching for specific things. Um, sorry, it's small. Searching for specific things and uh, inserting uh, special little comments in there. And then finally, I have a couple of documents in Markdown format that I insert into this code and I run it through, I run it through um, Roco, which is a documentation cool for, a tool for, for code, so that we end up with something like this in two columns, where on the right hand, there's a Ruby code. On the left hand, there is a documentation inserted inside the code. So we see in the first line, we have class definition and class inheritance. The next line is method definition, but it's also an init method, so it's a class initializer. It also has default argument values. It also has a block, block method argument. Here we see an instance variable, then the super call, then the setter method. And um, this is basically everything. Uh, it's uh, up on Heroku on explainruby.net. Um, I hope it will scale when everyone hits it at the same time. <laughs> it's a basic instance. Thank you. Um, the reason I didn't publish it on my day, because um, it still also has the same problems. When the code is more complex, it, uh, it you know, generates some weird things here on the right side. So if anybody can help with that, this documentation files are just markdown plain text files which are up on GitHub uh, under my account, Explain Ruby, 15. on GitHub. And uh, you can contribute to those even if you don't want to mess up with the parsing of the language. And those more experienced help me mess up with the parsing of the language. Five, and, four, you know, let's make this two, something. One. <laughs> really, really awesome. Thank you, Mislav. The only person to get a reverse heckle out of Ryan Davis. <laughs> Next up, Alex Chaffee. I still well. haven't gone yet. <laughs> okay, so um, this also is a project like Mislav's that owes a debt to Y and to Ryan Davis. It too uses uh, Ruby parser and Ruby to Ruby in a novel way. Um, it, and it was also sort of got ma made real uh, for a Y day project. Um, this is something, uh, oh, and it also was a debt to Flip, P-H-L-I-P, who I don't know if he's, in, if he's here because I don't know his real name. Um, and, uh, okay, here's, here's the basic idea about wrong. By the way, everybody laugh at this nice cartoon. Someone <laughs> is wrong on the internet. Um, I get it. We all love tests, right? But apparently we hate asserts. 
And the reason I know that is because nobody ever uses assert anymore. They use assert equal, or assert contains, or assert whatever. Or they use should. Somebody basically assert was so maligned that some people went and invented an entirely new system of testing that they call BDD, so they wouldn't have to use the word assert anymore. And Steve and I, Steve Conover, well, raise your hand, Steve, hi, um, decided to reclaim assert, to revive assert, because assert is great. And we wanted to give, to, to break down all the walls that keep people from using assert these days, right? So I'm just gonna step through a couple of the weird things, the wrong things about the current way of asserting things inside of your tests. So here's test unit. This is a standard X unit format. And by standard, I mean it is completely wrong. Um, you say normally when you want to assert that as something is equal to something else, you put the equal between the things that you're asserting about and you say the actual thing before the expected thing. That's actually, I think, one of the reasons people like uh, our spec so much because the should reverses that reversal. It puts it back into the natural order. Um, in our spec, so that worked. However, there's a whole lot of other problems with this, especially for novices. The should is, the, the syntax is very confusing. Like, what is should? It's a method, but it's a method on something weird, actually on object, which is totally bizarre if you're trying to teach that to somebody. And you have never have any idea for like the first six months you're using our spec where to put the spaces versus the dots versus the parens versus the underscores. Um, also, this double equal thing, it actually is not the equals method. It is a weird, uh, it's sort of a made up method on this proxy that should returns that you have to call in and that does the matching. So this isn't actually code. This is some weird thing that's inserted on top of your code that kind of looks like code. Um, Minitest is getting closer because it sort of revived assert. Um, however, the failure message for assert in this case as in others is not helpful. It just says, sorry, it failed. And if you're lucky, um, you've passed trace to rake so you get to see the line number that it failed at. Um, also, if you want to make the message more clear, you have to violate don't repeat yourself, right? If you look at this bottom line, by the way, I apologize to Shane for the bullet points. Um, assert time equals money. Well, there's time should equal money, which is useful. But you've repeated time, money, and equals. And then the should is obvious because, of course, you're in an assert. So what do we do? We turn assert back into something that can introspect the code that you are asserting about. And so it actually looks inside of the block of code and makes a useful message out of the code that you already wrote so you don't have to write it again. And by write it again, I mean not just in a string, but write it again by using one of these crazy, I'll go over here, one of these crazy methods. There's dozens, probably hundreds of methods in all these various test frameworks. And the only reason that we have all these asserts 30 seconds. is so the failure message comes out looking nice. Okay, so how do we do it? We cheat, we use Ruby to Ruby, but we open up the file on disk because we got the file and line number from the stack trace or from Ruby, everybody groan. Uh, okay, thank you, 15. but the point is that this is not production code. This is for use in tests. Okay, so everybody, I, I, I urge you to look at the readme and all the caveats that are out there, and plus I just wanna point out um, that we have console color, so you have no excuse not to use it. I know that no framework without console color gets anywhere these days. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Okay, so I have to ask your permission because we're now officially over time, but I've got Yehuda Katz and Blake Mizrani lined up to speak to you. What do you think? All right. So Yehuda wants to tell you a little bit about client-side caching, and I'm desperate to hear. All right. Okay, so uh, as I said to Avi earlier, ac action pack and action control are actually about HTTP plus responses, right? So here's a normal controller that you might get. Oh my God, what's going on? Fuck. Am I just screwed? Okay, this is a uh, normal controller that you might have in your application and you're uh, rendering a template and you're getting the information from the database. So let's say you have this situation and you want to have it be cached using HTTP caching based on the last time that this was modified. I'm gonna walk through how you might do that manually in a Rails application. We're gonna to get to not doing it manually soon. Um, so the first thing that you have to do is you have to grab out the if modified since headers from the request object and then parse that into a time, right? That's step number one. 
Step number two is you have two branches now, right? You have the, uh, what if, it, if there is no last modified at all, in which case that's just move on, right? Nobody's asking for any caching. Otherwise, render. Obviously, these are two different branches. That's why they look the same, but they're gonna be different in a second. The next step is if there isn't a last modified header, make one and set it to be the HTTP date of the last time the post was modified, right? Then in the else statement, so now that top part is basically done, right? Uh, in the else statement, we wanna say if the post modified is bigger than the last time, than the last modified from the browser, basically do the same thing. So I'm intentionally not being dry here. Um, but let's get dry, so move that render out, right? And now we can combine those if else, so if there isn't a last modified or if the post was modified since the last time the browser said things should be modified, set this header up. And then of course we need the case where the caching is happy, right? This is the case, this is the case that we wrote the entire thing for, so uh, set the status code to 304 and return. Don't return, uh, don't render anything. Okay, so this is what you have to do to do HTTP caching pretty much in every framework except for Rails because nobody gives you any help other than this. So this is it. Uh, this actually works, but let's actually start peeling it back to get to use thing, some of the Rails facilities. Uh, so first of all, we don't actually have to get the header from the headers hash. Uh, Rails gives us if modified since, and if modified since also gives us back a date. So that's good from the request object. Uh, the next step is, instead of setting the response that last modified header and doing that HTTP date weird thing we have to do, we can just set it on the response object. And you'll notice here, I started from Action Controller Metal, which is basically raw rack, and I pulled in now the rack delegation module. Uh, the next step is, it's kind of annoying to have to do if not, not last modified or post modified is bigger than last modified, so we can say if not modified, post modified, right? The next thing that we do is, that's annoying, we don't wanna have to, now we're like doing some stuff on the response object. Let's just say, pull in conditional get, and we can say if this thing is stale, and we can say last modified arrow post that updated at, render, and then the last thing is we'll pull in implicit render, and now we can just say fresh when last modified points that post that updated at, and uh, now that does all the things that were on the slides before, and then finally, um, obviously, I just showed that you can pull in some modules into Action Controller Metal, but of course, Action Controller Base already has fresh one built in. So, uh, basically, the short version of all that is, there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to do HTTP caching right. It's a good idea to do it. Almost nobody does it in the world. It's not a very what, talked about thing because doing it is a big pain in the ass. It's actually not that big of a pain in the ass in Rails, and people should do it more. And uh, as I said yesterday, Rails 3.1 will make, give you a better reason to do it, so. All right, thank you. Precision timing. Next up, Blake Mizrani, and I believe that we're gonna talk about Roundup. 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 Nick, can I have my last 20 seconds back? <laughs> All right, can everybody see that? Is it okay? It's at the bottom. It's okay. the bottom, yeah, no. There you go. Is that better? And let's just make that. All right. Does that work? And now, right. now we're completely lost, actually. All right. So you guys can see all this, this is good? Okay, so uh, Ryan was talking about his uh, shell scripting talk about set dash E, and uh, I wanted to give you a quick show of that and uh, what it can mean for testing uh, command line interfaces. So uh, one of the things I do a lot at Heroku, I spend more time building command line interfaces than I do building web interfaces anymore, so um, I needed a way to be able to test them uh, really well. So I, here is a little shell script that just prints out the host name, but if you look at that, it's a little more complex than that. There's a set dash E in there. What set dash E does is tell you that instead of running through every single command, it'll stop at the first one that uh, exits with a non-zero status. So you can see here that it should stop at false, right? So if I do, uh, there's also in shell, you can do a set dash X, which will give you the trace output. This tells you an execution, the subshells that it's going into, you can see with the plus signs, the uh, variable expansion and all of that, and you can see that it stopped at false. Right? So I thought, well, Shell is effing awesome at this, so, and this is a really, really solid feature of Shell, I wanna write a unit testing framework, and I wrote it in Shell, and it's called Roundup. It looks like this. Uh, when you run it, you can see that the test that failed, uh, it, it actually prints out what at the line that actually failed, and with the set dash X output. Um, and it comes in turn style output. The tests simply look like this. If we do uh, Roundup, uh, I'm gonna test the five, so, this here, I'm actually testing uh, the thing. So you can have befores, right? You can have afters, 
and you don't have to import anything or do anything. You just run this file. You just type it. Uh, just all your tests start with it underscore, right? So we can say it passes. Here I'm saying true. Uh, it fails. So if I do a roundup uh, and run the roundup five test, you'll see that the fail one failed. Uh, and let's see if we can scroll up here. And you can see that the it fails failed on false, right? So uh, I use this a lot because when I'm testing command line interfaces, um, or whenever I'm doing writing a lot of command line interfaces, I when I was starting to write tests in Ruby and using test unit, and I realized that's effing stupid because I'm actually writing a command line interface, so I should be testing it with the same language that I'm going to be using it with, which is shell. So I decided I'm, and plus I also realized that when I'm doing it this way, I wind up building better command line interfaces because it makes it easier to write tests with this thing. So uh, anyway, that's it. Thanks. Woo. Uh, and it's uh. You can find it, you can find it here. Beam is ready, round up. Beautiful.